All right. So in this lesson, we're going to talk all about how to do research when you're doing cross-cultural psychology. And it may seem like, okay, what's the big deal? We have a, you know, we have basic approaches to research. Let's apply them. But what you will uh, see throughout this lesson is that it's not so simple. It isn't simple at all. Uh, in fact, the way we collect data and the, the kind of responses that people give differ across culture in, in their own right. So we have to be very sensitive as to how we collect data and make sure that our data is representative and potentially generalizable to other cultures. So again, you know, those of you who have a had a course in research methods or experimental psychology, you understand how challenging research can be by itself, let alone trying to understand a phenomenon of cross-cultural nature. We have a hard time uh, applying our principles across uh, cultures. We have a hard time with our own thoughts, emotions, and behaviors and understanding them. So it is all the more so more challenging when we're trying to understand someone else's thoughts, emotions, behavior, and what is considered normal or acceptable across culture as well. So we really have to ask ourselves with all the cultures around the world, how do we decide which cultures to sample, right? So if you're doing cross-cultural research, which samples are you gonna look at? Well, there is some guidance here. This is not uh, uniform, but Imagine you are trying to see if factor X shapes factor Y. Then you would get, or you would attempt, and I'm gonna give you an example shortly, you would attempt to get two cultures that differ widely on whatever factor X is. So the example given is uh, whether or not two cultures differ on individualism. Uh, and how that might shape preference for uniqueness, right? So if we, if we were to take two cultures, we would find one culture that has high individualism and we would compare it against another culture that scores low on individualism and then we would collect our data, right? So if both cultures, despite the fact that uh, they were different on factor X, show similar responses on factor Y, you would find a universal. You would find uh, that it is not a culture dependent phenomenon. So that would be universality. But the more difference, the more differences you get, in factor Y, it's reasonable to believe that these cultures differ on whatever the phenomenon is. And in fact, the previous example of individualism, wanting to stand out and look and uniqueness, well, they're highly correlated. So we would find that in Western samples, if we were to compare them to South Asian or East Asian samples, you would get very, very different responses uh, to uh, need for uniqueness based on individuality. But the same way we can find notable differences, we can also find similarities or universals. So the principle remains that we would take at least two cultures that we believe differ on a factor and see how that impacts some dependent variable. All right, now, what are some challenges that we have when comparing across culture? Well, first and foremost, it's very important to understand 
the cultural norms and the practices of each of the cultures being studied. Because if you don't understand the cultural norms, it is quite possible that you might pathologize culture, you might consider the behavior abnormal when it's actually an acceptable practice. Uh, so we have to know what the cultural norms in each of the groups we're comparing are. And we have to see if those norms are also impacting the phenomenon being studied. Because if we don't pay attention to cultural norms, if we don't pay attention to the values of a culture, the accepted practices of a culture, then we run the risk of making uh, misinterpretations about a group or run the risk of making faulty assumptions about a group, and that's bad science. So the first issue is understand the cultural norms and practices of all the groups you're studying. So how do we do this? Well, there are different ways we can do this. We could do this through an ethnography, which is an in-depth case study of a culture. We could do this by inviting cultural brokers or foreign collaborators to be part of our study. Now, cultural brokers or foreign collaborators, these individuals have an understanding of the values of another culture. So they're able to unlock what is acceptable or unacceptable for that group. And another way we could do this is to immerse ourselves into whatever culture we're studying. So when we talk about the process of naturalistic observation, Usually that requires us to immerse ourselves in a culture and be part of that culture for six months, maybe a year uh, at end before we can draw meaningful conclusions uh, about that group. So naturalistic observations are quite powerful. Now, why do we say that you should stay within or immerse yourself in a culture for six months to a year. Well, there are several reasons why that it's important to stay with that culture for some time. The first is that it will take time for individuals to trust you and start to behave naturally. So it takes time for people to get used to you. So in the beginning, as a person who's not part of the community, people might be suspicious of you. So they're going to be on guard. Their behavior might not be uh, typical. And as you develop trust, the behavior becomes more natural. So that's the first reason why you might want to immerse yourself in a culture for an extended period of time. The second reason is that there are life cycle events. If, if you are there within a culture that you're unfamiliar with for a whole year, you're able to see the various rituals, ceremonies, holidays, et cetera, that people engage in. And you have a fuller understanding of the practices of that culture. But the shorter the amount of time you're there, uh, the more likely you're going to draw potentially a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation, a false conclusion, however you want to say, about the practices of a group. And I, I, I can't remember the name of the book, but there was a children's book where it, the, the protagonist of the book was an animal. And it took the animal through the four seasons and how the animal understood winter and thought, well, that's the climate. And that's how nature is. And then spring came. And then the nature and the climate changed. So then they're like, well, wait a minute. This is how things are supposed to be. And then summer came and then fall came. And all through this process, the animal was changing their understanding about nature. But only when you go through a full calendar year can you truly understand uh, the four seasons, so to speak, or in our sense, the, the various 
you know, cultural practices that might be linked to holiday cycles. All right, I, another uh, thing we wanna think about is we wanna make sure that whatever study we do, we have what's called methodological equivalence. Well, equivalence means that it's equal, right? And what this means in terms of methodological equivalence, we wanna make sure that whatever method of study we're using is understood identically or fairly identically across culture, right? Because it's, we understand that there might be small differences, but we wanna make sure that whatever approach we're using is uh, understood in all communities we're studying. Because in reality, it might be that how people understand your survey or fill out surveys and how they're supposed to respond to your surveys could differ across culture. And I'm gonna give you examples of how people might respond to your survey and how that could differ across culture as we progress. So you might wanna think about methodological equivalence if you're doing a study across cultures. So, you know, we might also need to use slightly different culture, different research methods with different cultures, especially when we have drastic differences between the value systems, practices, uh, and reading levels. There are many communities um, where being literate uh, is left to a select few, and there are many people who are not literate within the community. So you might not use a survey where people have to read. Uh, you might use an oral interview, right? And so these are all different ways we could approach the issue. Now, one of the, the things that we have seen, and I, I know I criticize this heavily, and I talked about this in our first discussion, that one of the ways that researchers avoid dealing with this problem is that they usually target college students, university students in industrialized nations. And that to me, when we're thinking of cross-cultural research really creates a bias in our understanding. So if you are only doing research in a industrialized nation, that research does not reflect the reality in the developing world. Does that make sense? So, and university students, university students are considered privileged in many communities, right? Whereas in the United States, we have a system where university is open largely for anyone who wants it. Now, granted, there are financial constraints and there are issues around it, even in the U.S. system. But if you're doing U.S., uh, pardon me, university samples, then in some communities, you're getting the elite of the elite. And that may not reflect to people of all socioeconomic statuses and the average person in a community. So these are some problems, right? So the the... The first issue that I uh, hope I'm impressing upon you is that one challenge we have is generalizability. Does the um, research finding generalize to non-college students or does it generalize to uh, the developing world, right? And the answer is more often than not, no. So we have this very select research, which might have a Eurocentric bias. And that is some of the criticism that a lot of uh, researchers have brought to the attention. Now, a, a second thing is what we call statistical power, which is a fancy way of saying the ability to detect a real effect going on. So, we might determine 
uh, some meaningful uh, power in college students, but when we apply it to the general population, it becomes weaker. So when we see comparing university students relative to non-university students, the ability to detect a real effect, which we call statistical power, drops considerably. That is, that is one of, of the major concerns. Another issue that we face is translation. And when you do research, across culture, you run the risk of things being lost in translation. You run the risk of certain psychological terms not being expressed in some communities or not even being recognized as legitimate in some communities. So it becomes tricky to study a psychological phenomenon in certain communities. And in fact, you know, if you study, I'm a clinical psychologist. So if you study mental health across cultures, in some communities, they prefer to describe things in medical terms rather than psychological terms. Because uh, the whole concept of psychological wellness and mental health treatment might not be recognized in the community, but a medical doctor is more acceptable across society. So we have to worry about stigma around mental health, acceptability, and whether or not these terms can even be translated meaningfully into another community. Now, if you are doing research, then you really, especially if you need a translation, you should have a bilingual translator as part of your research team who is responsible for translating it. And then you have a second translator take it from the language it was translated back to English. And I'm gonna give you two examples where I did this. Like I, I had the privilege to be part of two studies that we use this process of uh, a translator and back translation. The first was when I was a pre-doctoral intern at the Hamilton Madison House. Uh, we noticed that in the Chinese American community, there was a stigma around individuals being diagnosed with autism. So we wanted to try and understand whether or not people would be more acceptable if we converted an assessment into Chinese and then see how their responses would go. So we took the uh, childhood autism rating scale. It was at that time in its second edition and we translated it. Excuse me, my cat's popping in the window. Go, Smokey. All right, but um, so we translated it in, into Chinese and we had another translator translate it back. And it was very important to have two different people in the translation process because if it was translated and then the person who translated back to English did not see a close similarity to the original English childhood autism rating scale, then we run the risk of the instrument being compromised. So that was the first time I had the privilege of doing this process. The second time I had the privilege of doing this was when I was working on a research study on the mental health profile of the Coptic Orthodox community. Now, how many of you know what the word uh, Copt means? C-O-P-T. Feel is that a form of Christianity that's usually in like Egypt? And Good job. That's exactly what it is. So we have different subdivisions within Christianity. We have Catholicism. We have Protestantism. We have Orthodox Christianity. And even Orthodox Christianity splits into two subdivisions. 
And then we have other forms of Christianity. But the Egyptian Orthodox community um, migrated or started to migrate to the United States um, in the 1950s, roughly, somewhere around that. And we had first generation, second generation, and third generation, or to some third generation, individuals from Egypt. And we wanted to study the mental health profile. So every instrument we used had to be translated in Arabic because many of the first generation uh, Coptic Christians, they're monolingual Arabic speakers. So if you're gonna give a person a survey in English, either they're not gonna understand it or they're gonna just respond what they think you wanna hear because it's not in their native language or native tongue. So we had to have, and in this case, what we did was we had an Arabic professor uh, at the College of New Jersey uh, do the translation for us into Arabic. And then we had um, an Abuna, a father, translate it back from Arabic to English um, in order to make sure that it was acceptable. So these were my two research experiences where we had to use uh, translation and then back translation because we needed to make sure whatever instruments we're using were understood and were an accurate representation, A, of the instrument, but the responses were accurate representation of the experiences of the individuals in given cultures. So moral of the story is if you're dealing with translational issues, you're always gonna have to deal with uh, back translation. All right, now here's the deal though. It was nice, our study was fairly reasonable, but what do you do with certain words that don't translate into singular words in another language, such as schadenfreude, which is um, a word in German that is the, uh, and I'm going to have to describe it in a sentence, not a single word, relishing in the downfall or suffering of another person. Right? So relishing in the, the suffering of another person. So getting a joy out of someone else's suffering. Amai, amai is a Japanese word where it is a process by which an individual develops a relationship with another person to get them to take care of them. Whether it be a romantic partner, whether it be a parent, whether it be another individual. So it's some, the closest word in English you could get to a my is some kind of dependence on another or dependence, right? Uh, and then a word in English, self-esteem, right? What is self-esteem, right? So this is a broad umbrella term to how you view yourself. Right? But these words, if we were to translate them from one language to another, they don't always translate very well. I'll give you another one because you've heard it um, in psychology probably a thousand times. Free association, right? Free association is a word we use to describe a Freudian therapy process where you say whatever comes to mind, right? But that, isn't, that is a very loose English translation of a German word called Einfall. And an Einfall is a thought that pops into your head, right? Almost as if it's an intrusive thought or you know, it comes to mind. But it isn't just, hey, say whatever comes to mind. The focus is on 
the intrusive thought and how that shapes your psychological process. So it's interesting that how do we deal with these? Well, it's tough. More often than not, when you do your translation or back translation, you're going to put this in parenthesis to try and explain it, even though it's not a word. You might have a whole sentence to describe the word because you recognize that that culture may not use that. Another culture may not use that word. So this is another challenge we face uh, with translation. Now, I use the word cultural broker. And a cultural broker is not the same thing as a translator. I actually believe that cultural brokers are more appropriate when doing research than just a translator. Why? Because the role of a cultural broker is different. The cultural broker is going to not only translate, but they're going to explain intent of the words. They're going to explain something, whether it's uh, a normal response within a culture. They're going to give you the, the cultural element that as a, a person who's not steeped in that culture, you may miss. So if you have a translation, but it doesn't cover the cultural elements, you still couldn't interpret things wrong. So these are issues. Now, we also have to deal with response biases. So we have different sets of response biases. For example, it's not uncommon for us in the United States to respond with a social desirability response set. And a social desirability response set is when we answer a question in a way that creates a positive image of us, or in a way that we think people want to hear, right? Or is considered socially acceptable. That's social desirability. So we get this in Western communities often. So if I were to ask you a taboo within our society, such as your substance use, drug use, then depending on the drug we're asking, you might misrepresent the frequency by which you've tried it or your sexual practices. That is very personal. It is considered taboo to share some of these concepts. That's changing, but these are the kind of things where we might not be as honest about. But every culture has taboos. Every culture, depending on the laws or restrictions of the culture, they're gonna be taboos. So just like in Western society, we might misrepresent the number of sexual partners we've had. We might misrepresent the substances of abuse we used. Uh, in other cultures, it could be something different. For example, in Muslim communities, it is absolutely forbidden to use alcohol. So if you are a member of a Muslim community, in, in a Muslim, uh, predominantly Muslim country, you are gonna feel the social pressure to say, no, I've never used alcohol, even if you did. Does that make sense? So, because if you go against whatever the accepted norms, there's gonna be that tension. So you're gonna want to represent yourself in the most favorable of lights. So that's one form of a response set or response bias that we have to be concerned about. There are other response sets. And by the way, I'm gonna go back to that Coptic um, Orthodox study on mental health. I experienced this, a moderacy bias. So in addition to all the mental health factors, 
we, we use the daily spiritual experiences scale, which is a measure of religiousness or religiosity. And we saw something very peculiar. Most people did not select the highest score about religious belief and practice. And I was like, well, gee, why is that? And my co-researcher said, because in the Coptic community, there's always a striving towards growth. As soon as you say you've, you're as religious as possible, then there's no room for growth and that that's actually a threat to humility. So you're gonna wanna answer somewhere in the middle to imply that there's always more growth to be had. So that was an interesting phenomenon where people might answer more towards the middle. You could also have an extremity bias where people answer to the extremes as well. And I wanna show you how this might look. So if we were to look at this, this might be a good example of social desirability. I never laugh at dirty jokes, right? Maybe you never have. So you're going to pick strongly agree. But most of us have laughed at an inappropriate joke before, right? With sexual content. It, it, it just is. I have very few bad habits. Well, most of us have some bad habits, whether it be not putting the cap on the toothpaste, whether it be leaving your socks around the house. There could be a, a number of different bad habits, right? That we have, but the unwillingness to acknowledge common flaws is problematic, right? So if a person scores very high on social desirability, you really need to be concerned about that. Uh, I never lie. Well, there are some people who never lie, but the vast majority of us tell white lies, right? These subtle lies are like, you know, uh, how do I look? You look beautiful as the day I met you, right? That might not be true, but it feels good for people to hear that. Is, it in, is that a lie? Sure, it's a lie, but it's a reasonable, it's an acceptable lie, right? Uh, so if a person says, no, I never lie, uh, that's also a social desirability. So this is a good example of items that load towards social desirability. So uh, the next example I'm gonna give you is a moderacy bias, right? So a person who answers at the midpoint. Well, George Bush was a great president. George Bush was the greatest president. Stephen Colbert for president. Okay, this is a good example because obviously Stephen Colbert, his political point of view is not the same as George Bush, right? But if you say towards the middle on all of them, then you're, then you're hedging. So you're in the middle. So we have to be very careful with that. Um, now, an extremity bias would be where you say strongly disagree to Bush and strongly agree for Colbert, right? With no sensitivity towards the middle. That's an example of an extremity bias, right? So how do we deal with this? Uh, one thing we can do is um, do forced choice responses. Make people pick uh, an answer. You cannot get a moderacy bias if it's a yes, no question. There is no middle. It's either one, it's dichotomous, one or the other. Now, it's a trade-off. If you're worried about the moderacy bias, you can do this. But dichotomous variables lose sensitivity. So uh, the range of uh, agreement is lost in dichotomous variables. So you have to weigh 
How important is it to have the sensitivity of the spectrum against how important is it for me not to get a moderacy bias? Now, other things we could do is standardization. Uh, that is that we compare a group on different domains in relation to a reference group. And we convert the whole group average to a z-score. Now, if you've taken statistics, you learned about z-scores, right? So they're, they're standard scores where the mean is a zero and the standard deviations are in units of one. And we can determine how you responded relative to your peers. So instead of the objective, well, what was your raw score? We can now convert that raw score into something that is more meaningful, even with an extremity or moderacy bias. So I talked to you about that, right? With a Z score, we're creating an average of zero because then the zero is at the middle of the bell curve. And everyone, um, you know, they're compared relative to that group average. And your individual Z-score, we could plot you against the population's mean and standard deviation. So we get to see how people respond, uh, whether or not a person's more extroverted than they are conscientious. So we can compare you relative to your own scores as well. So to give you a sense, right? So if this is a person's response, we can see now, a z-score is going to have a positive side and a negative side, that a person is more extroverted than average and less conscientious than average, at least in this plotting. But one of the problems with that is that it works when comparing an individual that's part of a group. But when you do cross-cultural comparisons, it doesn't allow you to detect those differences between various groups or cultures, because we understand that in general, um, individuals from China tend to be more introverted than individuals from the United States, right? There is a more reserved nature. Now it does, uh, allow for comparison based on groups of patterns, right? So how do we um, how do we detect what is considered acceptable or unacceptable? We'll plot one community against the other. We won't be able to detect that, but we'll just determine where you are in reference to another. So similar to um, the conscientiousness and extroversion plot, we would do, Americans versus Chinese, and we would plot them on extroversion. So we could see the group differences, but it doesn't show you how that impacts individual scores. So that's the pro and con of you know, the norm reference. Now, we also have an acquiescence bias, which is the tendency to yay say, right? Just agree to everything. So how do we deal with a person's tendency to agree to everything we say? Well, we can do what's called reverse coding. Phrase some questions in a way that agreement would contradict other items on the test. So we can detect uh, your yay saying or acquiescence in the fact that you clearly didn't read the response is because if you did, it should have been the opposite answer. For example, right, an acquiescence bias in the previous one would have been George Bush is a great president, George Bush is the greatest president, Stephen Colbert for president, strongly agreed to everything. That's an acquiescence bias. But with reverse coding, look at what we did to the second item. So instead of saying George Bush was the greatest president, we said George Bush was the worst president. So now 
if you said strongly agree to item one and strongly agree to item two, then we can detect the acquiescence bias. Does that make sense? Because we would expect you to respond, pardon me, uh, if you said seven to the first one, you might say one or two to the second one, right? And then Stephen Colbert, you might say one. So you're gonna get responses on the wide spectrum. All right, now, whenever we do research though, we have to pay attention to whatever our reference group is because we can have a reference group effect. What does that mean? Our responses could be interpreted differently based on whatever group we're using. So let's say, how does a, a person respond to the item, I am tall? Well, it depends which culture we're looking at. So here's the author of our book, uh, Dr. Heine is 5'8". In Japan, he would be considered tall. Whereas in the Netherlands, they tend to be taller on average, he would be considered shorter. So the answer to the question, I am tall, would depend on what your reference group is. So we have to be careful with reference group biases. So how do we address reference group biases? Well, we can have very, very concrete measures that either provide scenarios as questions, what would you do, right? We can have uh, behavioral responses, so frequencies of a given behavior. How often do you do something? We can do behavioral or physiological measures to determine what's going on rather than your subjective interpretation of I am tall or any subjective interpretation. So we focus on concrete behaviors, physiological responses or scenarios. It's no longer your subjective interpretation. Now, we also have something called a deprivation effect. People tend to rate higher the things that they value but do not have over the things they actually ha have. So, for example, in American societies, we value humility more than Chinese. Why is that? Because on average, we score lower on humility than, than people from China. That's interesting. So we value something we don't yet have. Whereas uh, Chinese individuals, because they're more collectivistic, would value more choosing one's own goals more than Americans because Americans are more individualistic and already have that. So it's interesting that people will endorse more of the things that they want, but don't have or value that they don't have over the things they actually have. So how do we solve this problem? The answer is we don't have a good solution to this. There's nothing you can do to impact another person's value system. The only thing you could do is state in your discussion uh, the fact that this data could potentially have other explanations for it other than whatever our hypothesis was. So you want to interpret the results with caution. You want to build out the limitations of your discussion section and research. That's the only thing you can do to address this problem. Now, it's important to understand that Culture is not an independent variable that can be manipulated. You cannot manipulate someone's culture. That is a value system that people bring into the study. It's more of what researchers would call a participant value, variable, similar to one's age, gender, ethnicity, 
we can't actively manipulate these things. People bring them into the study. Now, culture is very similar to that. We cannot manipulate another person's culture. But here's the deal. Just because we cannot manipulate a person's culture does not mean we cannot measure cultural differences. So oftentimes we use uh, cultural differences as sort of like a quasi-experimental design where we look for um, differences in groups or between groups. Uh, we refer to that as a between groups manipulation or a within groups manipulation or looking for variability within a culture. So what is a between groups manipulation? That is also referred to as an independent groups design. And in a between groups or independent groups design, a participant serves in one condition. They're randomly assigned to condition A of an independent variable and different participants would be randomly assigned to condition B or C or D, however many conditions you have. But the importance is that you only participate in one of the groups or one of the conditions. And we wanna see if there are differences in the dependent variable based on the group you were randomly assigned to. Now, here's the challenge with between groups design or independent groups design. We need to make sure that before whatever we're studying, the groups were roughly equivalent or statistically equivalent. Otherwise, the results that we get could be due to our manipulation or due to some kind of pre-existing differences based on how we assign people. So many times when it comes to cross-cultural research, we will have what's called a pretest. And the pretest would allow you to measure the differences even before whatever manipulation we have. And assuming that they're roughly equivalent, then we could introduce the independent variable. Now, that is important, that equivalence, or we can do a matching variable if we don't want to do a, a pure pretest. Uh, that equivalence is important for us to be able to interpret the, the levels of the independent variable and how they might have impacted the dependent variable. Without knowing their equivalent, then we could have a static groups effect where it's just they started out differently from one another. So within groups, uh, manipulation is a little bit interesting, right? Across groups, we expect, let's say, uh, Iram and I, we, I expect differences between the two of us. But when I look at Iram relative to herself, I expect you to be relatively consistent within yourself, right? So within groups design, we're comparing the person relative to their other responses. So in a within groups design, oftentimes referred to as a repeated measures design, the participants are going through all of the levels or conditions of the independent variable. Now, we don't need to worry about random assignment to a, a specific condition because they're gonna get all of the conditions, all of the uh, um, levels of the independent variable. Now, what we do have to worry about is something called order effects. It is possible that the order of presentation of whatever you're measuring could alter responses later on. So we have something called counterbalancing. The term counterbalancing is that some participants are gonna get one sequence, so let's say you had two conditions, condition A, condition B. So some participants are gonna get A, then B. Other participants are gonna start with B and then go to A. So that counterbalancing will neutralize the, the potential of an order effect. Now you should have random assignment to the sequences though, right? You don't have to do random assign to a, con a specific group or condition, but you should randomly assign people to a specific uh, 
sequence, right, or order. Now, other really cool research that we could study culture with is studying neuroscience, right? The brain can shed light to uh, similarities and differences in various cultures. And it's not uh, subjected to the uh, social desirability biases, the acquiescence biases, your brain is going to respond to physiology in the way that it will typically respond. It's less likely to be influenced by personal biases or cultural norms. So um, as it relates to doing other studies, we could talk about situational sampling or cultural sampling. So what is a situational sampling uh, approach? A situational sampling is a two-step process where we have participants from various cultures generate situations during which they experience a psychological phenomenon, such as pride. Pride would be an attribute. By the way, pride is an attribute that you're gonna see cultural variability, right? In US samples, you're gonna see higher levels of pride than in other samples, but that doesn't mean that another group may not experience pride. For example, in a US sample, one might experience pride by making partner at a law firm because they had this notable individual achievement. Whereas in maybe Ecuador, uh, a grandparent might experience pride when they have a grandchild or they're attending to a grandchild. And the pride isn't about an individual achievement, but more of a familial, you know, process. So in any event, that's what we do. The first is we have participants from each culture generate situations where they experience pride. And then another group of participants assesses the less. Uh, generated by each group to determine patterns. So we're going to examine cultural differences to how people respond to similar situations and um, differences across experiences. So individual experiences, how different cultures relate and how people respond to different situations altogether. Does that make sense? Um, I think I said it you know, almost circularly. So one situation, different responses or different responses to different situations. Okay. Now we also have uh, cultural priming, which is designed to induce one's cultural way of thinking uh, in participants who are not actually part of a given cultural group. So the premise of cultural priming is that we recognize or we assume that there are, while there are differences in thinking between the various cultures, right? And even when we acknowledge the differences in cultures, our way of thinking still might be present in the other culture to some degree. So for example, if I prime individualism, right, we might get some I, me, uh, I, me uh, responses, right? Even in people are, uh, from collectivistic societies. And similarly, in individualistic societies, we can get the we, us pronouns, the more collective or plural version um, in individualistic society. So we can prime other ways of thinking, even though someone is not part of that culture. All right, so, so we're studying culture, right? How do we study culture outside of studying people? Well, we could study culture through film. We could study culture through art. We could study culture through uh, newspaper clippings and whatnot. 
because our cultural experience is expressed in indirect ways. So if we look at the kind of movies that are successes in the United States, that would give a messaging about what we value. If you look at advertisements uh, for the Super Bowl, right? That's going to give a messaging as to what we value. And if we went to other places, the advertisements would look very different. So it's something to think about. Now, when we're evaluating cultural messages, we need to have a coding system. Now, before you even have research, um, researchers score, let's say commercials, you have to come up with an objective scoring system. That's what the coding is. Coding is the scoring system you're gonna use. And then you're applying that scoring system to whether it be um, commercials, newspapers and whatnot. And you're, whatever you're looking, whatever categories you're looking for. Now here's the deal. If I were to score um, a newspaper, I might get different responses than Strahinya. We might have looked at the same newspaper and come to different conclusions about whether something is a collectivistic theme or not, right? As the examples on the slide. Now, we always have multiple researchers scoring the same thing to make sure that there is consistency in a theme. Now, the, it's very important that if, if Strahinya and I were doing this scoring procedure, we shouldn't know what the objective of the researcher is because we could alter responses based on knowing the objective, right? So we should be blind to whatever the hypothesis is. Now, what we would do afterwards is we would look for a measure called inter-rater reliability. We would look for consistency between myself and Strahinya. And there is a, a, a mathematical calculation called Cohen's Kappa that could determine the level of agreement between his scoring of the, the codes versus mine. Now, we also have to understand the process of unpacking or unpackaging uh, culture, right? Because, you know, cultural differences are everywhere. They're in our actions, they're uh, in symbols and whatnot. So we have to figure out, well, what actions, what symbols might be re reflecting some cultural difference? So we have to find a best, the best way of saying it is uh, finding the underlying variables that might shape or create these cultural differences. So how do we do it? First, we come up with some hypothesis, right? So we have to find some theoretically viable variable that could explain the cultural uh, differences. Then we have to test it and see if we can get confirmation of whether or not this cultural difference is impacted by whatever the underlying variable is. And we have to show some stable relationship between it. So some reliability for it. If we can't get through steps two and three, then we're back to the drawing board. And we're gonna come back with some other potentially viable variable to interpret this and run it through the same process until we come up with some meaningful underlying variables that could explain these cultural differences. Now, so here we are, I talked to you about all these different research strategies, but if you took me for research methods, you would have heard me say repeatedly, there's no perfect research strategy. There's no research strategy that is uh, absolutely better than the next. Every single research strategy has strengths and weaknesses. 
Every single research strategy allows you to do certain things, but doesn't allow you to do others. So what do you do with that? The best thing you could do is study the same phenomenon using multiple methods. So instead of just giving a survey, do an experiment alongside a survey or do observational research or do some uh, biological research, whatever it might be, the more of these studies that come to the same conclusion, the more confidence we have in our interpretation. And if you took me for research methods or statistics, you would have heard me say that every single study could potentially be an outlier. Every individual study could be an outlier because we set a level of significance at 0.05. So we allow some level of error to occur in our study. Now replicating a study using multiple methods is going to increase our confidence in an outcome. So it's no longer about an individual study, it's multiple studies using multiple designs coming to the same conclusions that we could say, ah, oh, I think I found something or that creates more compelling evidence to whatever we're trying to claim. Now, I actually added this, I added an article after this study, Nispa and Cohen in 1994, uh, they studied the principle of Southern honor. And so they did a follow-up study, which was really, really cool in 1996. And I put that in your interesting articles if you want to read it. But what, what does it mean to have honor? What does it mean to uh, stand on your honor? So when it comes to Southerners, honor is very important. But that also comes with uh, how do you handle being slighted? How do you handle someone treating you in a dishonorable way. And what Nisbet and Cohen found was that Southerners are more prone to violence than Northerners. And it, they're more prone to violence in scenarios, what would you do? They're, right, so there's uh, more aggression attached to uh, your honor being violated. There's more um, of a ho hormone of aggression, cortisol and testosterone in Southerners than Northerners. And you might say, well, gee, that's really interesting. So on a biological and on a behavioral level, Southerners are more prone to aggression. The question is why? Now, these are not all of the answers to the question. But here are some of the answers historically or intergenerationally. So we take people through time and we acknowledge that there's an evolutionary process. So herding is more common in the South, right? It also allowed people to steal from one another. Uh, because it's hard to, if you're herding, let's say cattle, it is very hard to keep track of every single one of the cattle. So people could poach some of your cattle. And well, that would really upset you. And in order to protect your herd, you might have developed aggressive tendencies to protect it. That's one explanation. Uh, and, and that's that. Now, so you could look at it, whether it's um, archival research, survey research, physiological research, behavioral research, we see this pattern over and over and over. Just think of, you know, um, the violence even 
with civil rights, you know, from an archival point of view. It's been there. So there's a lot of research to support it. So uh, if you look at the archival research, we see more homicides, especially murder in the South. Survey researchers, this is the article that I gave you or part of the article I gave you. Um, Southerners are more likely to condone violence to defend one's honor. And then physiologically, we see spikes in testosterone when Southerners are insulted, whereas Northerner, Northerners, we don't see these spikes or we see, I shouldn't say we don't, we see lower levels of these spikes. So it's interesting. Who would have thought that perhaps Southerners are wired to be more aggressive. Now, uh, behavioral research, Southerners are more likely to confront an oncoming stranger than a Northerner. And um, even in field experiments where we created a fictitious scenario where um, a, a a job applicant was convicted of a crime, we, we made it sound like the, the crime was associated with defending their honor. While the Southerners were more likely to say that the job applicant was more justified than Northerners. So look at these different methodologies to determine that Southern honor is a real thing, right? And it, it is linked to aggression. Now, at face value though, you know, you see hospitality and this overt politeness, but when it comes to honor, all that politeness goes out the window. So that's an interesting finding. So let's summarize, let's see where we are. So if we're gonna study cultural differences, we have to be very aware and vigilant about the issues and problems in research design. We have to think about how to address these issues. Some have clear cut uh, corrections, many of them don't. So for the designs that don't have a clear cut solution, use multiple methods. And dare I say, use multiple studies using multiple methods because you have different samples to get that consistency. We also, if we're gonna truly understand the underlying variables that are important for a culture, we have to unpackage them. So we have to find a way to identify or unpackage culturally specific variables. And Hopefully, uh, as you will see throughout the semester, cross-cultural research can be challenging, but is absolutely wonderful for those of us who do it. Uh, it is enjoyable, it is informative. You don't always know what you're going to get when you do cross-cultural research, but it's, it's really, really cool. So I'm gonna stop there, but uh, I'm going to see if there are any questions or comments that people might have.